this week wanted 27,000 new passenger aircraft. The NTSB recommends external cameras on airliners, and the 2012 Gordon Bennett race has a winner. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to the Friday bi weekly edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. The latest global market forecast from Airbus identifies a need for some 28,200 passenger and freighter aircraft between 2012 and 2031, worth nearly $4 trillion, reconfirming an upward trend in the pace of new aircraft deliveries. Of these, over 27,350 will be passenger aircraft of 100 seats or more, valued at $3.7 trillion. Passenger traffic will grow at an average annual rate of 4.7% in the next 20 years, during which some 10,350 aircraft will be replaced by new, more efficient models. By 2031, the world's passenger fleet will have expanded by 110%, from slightly over 15,550 today to over 32,550. In the same period, the world's freighter fleet will almost double from 1,600 to 3,000 aircraft. Asia Pacific will account for 35% of all new aircraft deliveries, followed by Europe and North America with 21% each. In value terms, the single biggest market is China, followed by the U.S., United Arab Emirates, and India. If you think those rear view cameras on automobiles today are a great deal, well, you're gonna love this. The NTSB has issued a recommendation to the FAA that large planes be equipped with an anti-ground collision aid, such as an onboard external mounted camera system, to provide pilots a clear view of the plane's wingtips while taxiing, to ensure clearance from other aircraft, vehicles, and obstacles. On large airplanes, the pilot often cannot easily see the airplane's wingtips from the cockpit. The NTSB said that the anti-collision aids should be installed on newly manufactured and certified airplanes, and that existing large airplanes should be retrofitted with the equipment. NTSB Chairman Deborah Herzman says, quote, While collision warning systems are now common in highway vehicles, it's important for the aviation industry to consider their application in large aircraft, end quote. The recommendations follow three recent ground collision accidents, all currently under investigation, in which large planes collided with another aircraft while taxiing. The NTSB made the same recommendation to EASA, which set standards for aircraft manufacturers in Europe. You're watching Airborne. When we come back, ballooning across Europe in one of the world's oldest aviation challenge events. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-y at aero-news.net. A pair of French balloonists have eked out a narrow victory over 16 other teams from eight nations in the 2012 Gordon Bennett Balloon Race. ANN's Glenn Moyer has more details. Thanks, Ashley. The Gordon Bennett Cup, or Coupe Aeronautique Gordon Bennett, is the world's oldest gas balloon race. It began in Paris in September 1906, 
sponsored by Millionaire Sportsman and the owner of the New York Herald newspaper, James Gordon Bennett, Jr. The goal of the race is quite simple, to see who can fly the longest distance from a common launch point. The 2012 race began on Saturday evening, September 1st, with the launch of 17 two-man gas balloon teams from the small Swiss village of Ebnet Capel in the Togenborg Valley region. The race ended some three days later on Tuesday the 4th, when French team number one, comprised of pilots Sebastian Rowland and Vincent Ley, landed safely in Spain, just north of Seville. The two men had been in the air just over 69 hours and covered a distance of 1,620 kilometers. Swiss team number one, with pilots Kurt Frieden and Pascal Wittpradiger, finished second, a mere 18 kilometers short of the French. Indeed, the Swiss might have won the event, but they were forced to land early when their flight path took them into a restricted military zone. That allowed the French to overtake them for the victory. American team number two, with pilots Andy Caton and Bill Manuel, finished third with a flight of 1,370 kilometers, lasting just over 42 hours in the air. In all, seven of the 17 teams had flights of more than 1,000 kilometers. Today, the teams are all back in Switzerland, where they'll be fated with a public ceremony tonight featuring a hot air balloon glow. Then comes tomorrow's official awards banquet and the presentation of the Gordon Bennett Cup to the winning French team. I'm Glenn Moyer for Airborne and the Aero News Network. After three years in production and a fleet of well over 100 aircraft, the Cub Crafters Carbon Cub SS is evolving for 2013, the company says. Highlights include a new cowling design, an improved cabin heat system, a new starter, and a new system voltage monitor. New options are also being introduced, including a ground adjustable propeller from Whirlwind, a GPS equipped emergency locator transmitter, and new amphibious floats from Aeroset are coming soon. Cub Crafters is now accepting orders for the 2013 Carbon Cub SS. Prices start at $172,990. Airbus says it will sell airplanes and builds in China only to Chinese clients, but that does not mean they will never end up flying for other nations' airlines. An agreement struck in 2005 which led to the establishment of an Airbus factory in Tianjin, restricted the sale of airplanes built in China to Chinese companies only. However, a leasing exemption was agreed to before Airbus and the Aviation Industry Corporation of China inked a deal to continue building Airbus planes in China through 2026, including assembly of the new A320neo. An Airbus spokesman says that when a Chinese leasing agency purchases aircraft assembled in China, it is possible that those airplanes will wind up with non-Chinese airlines, according to a report appearing in the French news service AFP. And the French financial publication Le Echos reports that leasing firm ICBC was set to provide an A320 to Air Asia, a low-cost carrier in Malaysia. The Tianjin plant is Airbus's only non-European assembly plant now, though the plane maker announced in July it would be building a factory in Alabama. The United States Navy has told the FAA that it should relocate at St. Mary's Airport in southeast Georgia because of its proximity to the Kings Bay submarine base. The Navy says the airport is a security risk. In a letter to the FAA Southern Region sent Tuesday, Navy Southeast Region Commander Rear Admiral John C. Scorby said it was renewing its call to move the airport, quote, to ensure safe and uninterrupted operations at this strategically critical installation, end quote. A similar letter was sent to the city of St. Mary's. The Florida Times Union reports that the issue came to a head recently when two skydivers were blown off course and landed on a baseball diamond on the base. And it wasn't the first time skydivers had landed on the Navy base accidentally. The city of St. Mary's subsequently terminated the lease for the jumping place, which had been operating from the airport. The jumping place, meanwhile, has filed a formal complaint with the FAA over the revocation of its authority to operate from a federally funded airport. 
The skydiving company says its permit was revoked without due process. The city of St. Mary's must reply to the complaint by today, Friday, September 7th. It's Friday and time once again for commentary from ANN's editor-in-chief, Jim Campbell. Today, Jim asked the question, what's the AOPA doing competing with other aviation businesses? Thanks, Ashley. Hi, folks. I'm doing this one a little bit early because, uh, as you see this, I'm off in Japan uh, visiting friends and soon-to-be family. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, down the line. But to make a long story short, there's something at Oshkosh that occurred that bothered me that I just really thought needed to be said out loud. And the interesting thing is it didn't come from who I expected. Uh, I expected to get a fair amount of uh, scatter from the flight planning committee, the online folks that are building uh, flight planning utilities for PCs and Macs and iPads and iPhones. But what I got were from other people in the industry who work with the flight planning community or know people in the flight planning community who seem pretty upset at some recent decisions by AOPA. Well, let's face it, they've been a bit controversial since uh, Phil Boyer retired. Uh, the new leadership has a rather intriguing way of looking at what it thinks AOPA should be doing on behalf of its members or maybe on behalf of its own egos. But to make a long story short, they made a decision recently to deal with an outside company to develop a product that is in direct competition with the wing X's and the four flights that have, to a certain extent, created more utility and more value for the aviator than any recent group of products in, in, in quite some time. I heard not from the flight planning community per se, although I've talked to them about it, but people from throughout the community want to know why AOPA thinks it's, this, it's in their business to compete with aviation business. And we've seen it before. They've got their own insurance company. They've competed with media. As a matter of fact, they're interfering with other media, in my opinion. They sure want to craft the message and own the message. But in the flight planning game, it's just completely an in-your-face decision. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. But what they are doing, in my opinion, is stifling innovation, sending the wrong kind of message, and more important, victimizing a group that in the past has been very supportive of AOPA and certainly of the pilot community. So my big question is this. Is AOPA in the business of building AOPA as a business, or is AOPA in the business of serving aviation? If so, I wish they'd stick to that. Get rid of the egos, get rid of the nonsense, quit trying to harm the rest of aviation through their own self-interest, and maybe just do their job, which in my opinion is to put forward a program and a mission plan that promotes aviation for us all. And competing with aviation business is not the way to do it. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell. When Jack Mirren of Wilton, New Hampshire, developed a science project, he probably didn't know that it would be as successful as it was or that it would startle a homeowner 10 miles away. Mirren, an eighth grader at Pine Hill Waldorf School in Wilton, New Hampshire, devised a project in which a weather balloon would carry a camera and weather recording instruments aloft. He said he didn't know how high it would go, but it certainly exceeded his expectations. Mirren and his parents launched the balloon from Bedford, New Hampshire. According to a story appearing on Boston television station WCVB, it went to 110,000 feet, the fringe of space, before it eventually exploded. The onboard parachute deployed as planned and allowed the payload carrying the experiments to come safely back to Earth, landing in the driveway of a homeowner in Manchester, New Hampshire, about 10 miles away from the launch site. The homeowner, Sean Tolan, said the camera was still going when he retrieved it from his driveway. Tolan called police because he had no idea of the payload's origin. The police discovered Mirren's contact information inside the payload box and all ended well. The pictures and weather data he obtained will be used in a science fair project later this year. And remember, Airborne is now seen twice weekly, Tuesdays and Fridays on Aero TV. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're Airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday with another edition of Airborne.